Hello there and welcome to another episode here on the Strong by Design podcast hosting today, Chris Wilson. So honored and blessed to uh, have this guest with us today, a return guest, uh, our, his third visit here on Strong by Design. So we could, we could call you a Strong by Design friend right. at this point. And uh, it's we actually have the same T-shirt. We on do. Right Check this too. out. And get a round Which, of applause for the T-shirt right there. Yeah, <laughs> it's great, man. And that that's a hundred percent unscripted. I did not say anything to him or his <laughs> team about wearing our shirt. So uh, thank you so much for that, Frank. But uh, I want to. Uh, for our listeners who are maybe new to the show, thank you so much for finding the Strong by Design podcast. I'm not sure how you came across it, but you have landed on a terrific episode uh, that could be life-changing for you. We, we do ask, of course, that if you love this episode and it moves you in some way, at the end, please share it with a friend or family member, somebody that could be touched uh, or, or moved or inspired for a positive change in their lives. We we. That's why we do this show. It's a ministry for us, and uh, we just absolutely love it. We're in our fifth year of the show, and we're so grateful. If you're a return listener, then you've probably heard Frank Turek before on the show. He was on episode 65 and episode 186, and both of those episodes are fantastic. I encourage you to go back and listen to those. And um, so, again, our guest, Frank Turek. He's a, a huge inspiration for me. I've been a, a follower of, of what he's been doing in the world for several years now. I've read his books. I listen to his podcast regularly. And his latest book, Hollywood Heroes, uh, really got me excited several months ago when he started talking about it on his podcast and radio show. And so I said, I, as soon as I heard about it, I said, well, I can't wait to have him back because I know what we're going to talk about. If you're watching this on video, you can see behind me I have a display case with a lot of action figures and I have a wall of action figures over here. I've been a bit of a collector and uh, I love the superhero story uh, because I feel like we all kind of are drawn to it for, and some people not sure maybe why they're drawn to it, but I think this episode could reveal that. So our guest today, Frank has been on the strong by design show. As I said, a couple of times, he's an award-winning author and co-author of several books that I have here with me actually. Correct, not politically correct, Stealing from God, which our episode 65 was based on, and the name of his podcast, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, was his co-authored book with Dr. Norman Geisler, who if you, if you listen to his podcast, you will hear a lot about that uh, man because he was a mentor of Frank's. Um, Frank hosts a weekly TV program that's broadcast to 32 million homes. And an apologetics podcast that I've said, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, which is fantastic. Um, my gosh, how many episodes do you have on that show, Frank? On the I Don't right Have now. Enough Faith to Be an Atheist? Oh, I don't know. Probably 300 by now. Yeah, because we've been doing it at, for at least probably 12 years. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's it's yeah. a lot. It's a lot. Um he, he has uh, listened and heard on 180 different stations. He's the founder and president of crossexamine.org, and he speaks over 100 times a year, live in person. He comes down to Florida quite often. I've seen him here myself, which is an absolute pleasure. Uh, and he often speaks to youth and college students. He goes to college campuses and university campuses to speak with the young people about the importance of of what we're going to be talking about today, the importance of the gospel and the story of Jesus. And he has debated several prominent atheists, including Christopher Hitchens and Michael Shermer, just to name a few. This book today, the, the reason for this episode is about his latest work, Hollywood Heroes, that he co-wrote uh, with his son, Zach Turek. Um, his son is a captain. He's a career intelligence officer in the U.S. military. Uh, he has a master's degree in philosophy from Southern Evangelical Seminary, which is also where you uh, mm -hmm. got your degree from as well, which is fantastic. I have to ask to start us off today, how cool was it to write a book with your son? Yeah, it started about five years ago, Chris, when uh, my son, Zach, who's now 34 years old, uh, he's, he's actually a major now in the Air Force. He's got promoted again. Uh, he's been a movie buff his whole life, and we got talking about five years ago about how many of these characters in these superhero and fantasy movies actually exhibit 
characteristics of the ultimate hero, Jesus, and how many of these storylines point to the Christian storyline. In fact, they're borrowed from the Christian storyline to a certain extent. That's why the subtitle of the book, Hollywood Heroes, is How Your Favorite Movies Reveal God. And uh, so we go through uh, some of the biggest blockbuster series of all time in the superhero and fantasy genre. So we got Captain America, Iron Man, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, Wonder Woman, Batman, Superman. There's a little bit of Spider-Man in there as well. And all of those superheroes in some way point to the ultimate hero, Jesus. And so much of what goes on in those movies, although there is obviously some unbiblical material in some of these movies, but so many of these movies have biblical life lessons in them. And I don't even think the writers of these movies realized they were putting that in there. But they live in God's world just like we do, and they, they know what resonates with people. They know that sacrifice resonates with people and selfishness doesn't. And uh, so all of these superheroes sacrifice to take people in danger to a place of bliss and safety. And that's what we all want. We all that's want right. that. We all want to be taken out of this world of pain and suffering to a place of bliss. And that's exactly what Christianity does. That's what Jesus has done and ultimately will do when he comes again. Could you briefly share the story of Michael Mansour, the Navy SEAL? Uh, yeah, because Michael you know what? You, you, you start all of your talks and you started the audio the audio version of this mm -hmm. in the in, in the book off with this story. And I think yeah. it's a real touching and moving story. Yeah, Michael Mansour on September 29th, 2006 was operating in Ramadi, Iraq. He was standing on a roof in Ramadi and he was standing in front of a doorway to this roof. And he has two Navy SEAL colleagues lying at his feet in the sniper-prone position. They've already been attacked with AK-47 fire and a rocket-propelled grenade, but they're not exactly sure where the enemy is. There's a bit of a lull in the fighting. Insurgents have blocked off the streets in Ramadi, and there's someone on the loudspeaker in the town mosque yelling, Kill the Americans! As Monsor and his team are looking for the next attack, an insurgent from an unknown location throws a grenade up on the roof. It hits Monsor in the chest and it falls to his feet. Due to the length of the throw, there's no opportunity to pick it up and throw it back. He has only a split second to make a decision. He can leap through the doorway behind him and save himself, but if he does, his two teammates lying at his feet will surely die. Monsor yells, Grenade! <clears throat> but instead of jumping backward to save himself, he jumps forward chest first onto the grenade. It detonates. 30 minutes later, 25-year-old Michael Monsor is dead. And his two colleagues lying at his feet receive only minor injuries because Monsor's body muffled the blast. One of the survivors said at Monsor's funeral... Mikey looked death in the face that day and said, you will not take my friends, I will go in their stead. Now, I've never seen a United States president cry until April of 2008. That's when President George W. Bush gave Monsor's parents his, Monsor's, Medal of Honor posthumously. And he couldn't, he couldn't even hear the citation without crying, the president. Yeah. Uh, since then... Monsors High School has turned their stadium into Michael A. Monsor Memorial Stadium. They have the golden trident insignia in the center of the field. And uh, just in January of 2019, the United States Navy commissioned the USS Michael Monsor, newest, one of the newest guided missile destroyers in the fleet. Now, they did all this because Michael Monsor literally sacrificed himself to save his friends. So I always ask people, Michael Monsor sacrificed himself to save his friends. Would anyone sacrifice himself to save you? And the answer is, someone already has. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, but a lot of people don't think the story's true. They think it's invented. And so we spent some time in Hollywood Heroes giving evidence that, yay, God exists, number one. And number two, Jesus did rise from the dead to prove he is God. And of course, then number three, by trusting in him, you can not only be forgiven, you can be given his righteousness. And uh, so much of what Michael Monsor did in real life is actually exhibited. Of course, it was exhibited in real life by Jesus as well. Except whereas Monsor died for his friends, Jesus not only died for his friends, he died for his enemies. He sacrificed himself. 
Uh, and But so many of these other heroes, superheroes and fantasy figures, that's what they do. And they all point to the greatest story ever told, the story of Jesus. Yeah, isn't it wonderful that the greatest story ever told is actually real? It's true. <laughs> yeah, it's the true myth, as Tolkien yeah. told C.S. Lewis. Yes. Lewis hey, was always... I'm going to get there. You, you, you. Okay. <laughs> no, but I love it. It's, it's, it, we are. We're going to get there, I promise, because I love that part of it. Mm -hmm. um, listen, I could ask you a hundred questions about this book, at least, and the superheroes that you bring to life in the book. And you, I highly urge anyone to get the audio book version of it. I have the, like I said, I have the real hold in your handbook right here, which is always great. And I love to put it on my bookshelf because I, I have a lot of Frank's books. But the audio version, he reads it. It's his voice. He does the, I remember you doing on your podcast show after you did the audio book, you were a bit hoarse because of oh, all, yeah. the, all the reading. And, uh, but it takes it a long out. time to do an audio book. You got to oh. go back because, you know, you, you flub half the time. You don't get the pronunciation right. You know, it takes a long time. But when, once you finally get it, it's done. So yeah, that's if, right. if you want a New Jersey guy yelling at you the whole time, then you can get the audio book. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I love it. I love it. So um, I want to give the listeners, obviously, a, a, a good overview as best we can in, inside of an hour show of your book. So I, I selected mm -hmm. a handful of, of things of topics to discuss. Let's just start in the Marvel universe with All two right. of my favorites, Captain America and Iron Man. Um, what is the most unique characteristic of Captain America and how does that relate to Jesus? The most unique characteristic of Captain America is that he's righteous from the very beginning. You never have to worry, is Captain America, Steve Rogers, going to make the right choice when he's in a difficult situation? He's always going to make a right choice, right? In, in training, he's the one that dives on the grenade to save everybody, right? He thought it was a real grenade, but it really wasn't. You know, he's going to sacrifice himself uh, against uh, Iron Man, who's trying to take out Bucky in one of the movies, you know, his, his friend Bucky. He's, he's going to sacrifice himself to save the world from, uh, a, you know, a missile attack. You never have to worry about Iron Man, I mean, with uh, Captain America. Iron Man, on the other hand, Tony yep. Stark, you know, he needs a lot of character development. He starts as an amoral, billionaire, playboy, arms dealer who you don't think he could ever be a hero, right? But through a series of events, he ultimately does become a hero. And spoiler alert, at the end of Endgame, he sacrifices himself to save the world. So Iron Man and Captain America are on crisscrossing arcs. Whereas Captain America doesn't need a lot of moral development, but he needs a little bit more of a life. Iron Man has a life, even though he's kind of lost, but he needs a lot of moral development. And he becomes more moral and actually becomes a hero by the end of the whole series. So there are two colleagues that have crisscrossing arcs, and it makes for a really interesting story. It really does. And that's, that's exactly what I, I wanted to ask about was people today seem like they're really struggling to find their identity and their purpose mm -hmm. in life because we're, we're, we're all so much invested in the material world and everything's yep. an idol, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and, yep. people, and people have come up empty because there's no real meaning. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, happiness is fleeting when they put mm -hmm. invest all their – all their love in, in something that's, you know, going to fade away. Right. And, and, I, and I love what you did, too, in the book is you really talk about how the actor himself, Robert Downey Jr., was a, like a mirror image in a lot of ways of the Iron Man character. Yeah, there's probably nobody in movie history that has played a role more appropriate uh, for him than Robert Downey Jr. playing Iron Man because Robert Downey Jr., was a millionaire, maybe not a billionaire, but a millionaire who had it all and got into himself into a lot of trouble personally. Well, so did Tony Stark, right? Yep. And we think in life, if we could get the big three, the big three, what are the big three in life that are going to make us happy? Sex, money, power, right? If we get sex, money, power, we think we got it made. Well, Tony Stark has sex, money, power, and he's still miserable. Why? Because he's got no purpose. He's got no identity. And then, as you know, a weapon, one of his own weapons, his company sold to terrorists, detonates near him, puts shrapnel in his chest, and then he has to have a device installed in the center of his chest to guard his heart from encroaching shrapnel. If that device fails, he dies. Now, this is a beautiful picture of what I think is the second most important verse in the entire Bible to today's culture. The most important, of course, is still the gospel, 
But the second most important verse, I think, comes from the Old Testament, Proverbs 4.23, which says, above all else, guard your heart because everything you do flows from it. Above all else, guard your heart. doesn't say follow your heart. If you follow your heart, you're going to wind up like Tony Stark. You're going to wind up full of anxiety, alone, directionless, with, with just just a, a lot of trouble in your life. Yeah. You've got to guard your heart, and that's what Tony Stark ultimately learns to do. He guards his heart and focuses on what's really important. So as I said a minute ago, he actually sacrifices himself in Endgame uh, to defeat Thanos. Now imagine, Chris, um, you know, the world says follow your heart, the Bible says guard your heart. Now imagine that at the end of Endgame, instead of Tony Stark sacrificing himself as Iron Man to defeat Thanos, he turns to his Avenger buddies as they're about to take on Thanos, and he goes, you know what, guys? I'm not really feeling it today. I don't want to take on Thanos. In fact, you know what I need to do? I need to get back to following my heart and taking care of just me. I'm out. And then the movie ended. Would anybody be enchanted with that ending? Would anybody go, oh, great, he's following his heart? No, no one would go, this guy's a hero. We'd go, this guy's a zero, yep. right? Yet the culture tells us to follow our heart, but when we see someone following their heart like this, we go, that guy's not a hero, that guy's a zero. Instead, he sacrifices himself, and he's a hero, and that's inspiring to everyone. Why? Because we live in this world, and even atheistic screenwriters know that if he were to follow his heart, it wouldn't be inspiring, it wouldn't enchant anyone. He had to sacrifice himself and that made for an inspiring, enchanting movie. Because we all want to be taken from this world. We all want to have a hero come in and save us and take us to a place of bliss. And that's what Jesus actually does. So what we say is, look, if you like Iron Man, you're going to love Jesus. Yeah. If you like Cap Captain America, you're going to love Jesus. If you like Harry Potter, you're going to love Jesus. Because Jesus is the perfect representation of what all those characters do. Yeah. And, and I was, you know, the, the Iron, the original, the first released movie in this whole series right of t over 20 movies was the iron man uh was the first iron yeah, man 2008 movie. yeah yeah and mm -hmm. if, if it's not for the success of that character in that movie oh yeah the, the whole thing collapses right yeah so john really favreau who who was a director uh was campaigning uh the uh the movie house for downey jr to be the actor and they didn't really want jr to be the actor but he kept persisting, and thankfully he won, because if he hadn't played Iron Man, if somebody else had, he probably wouldn't have done a good a job. And who knows if we'd have a number of other movies coming after that, yep. because if that one didn't do very well, they go, well, why, why spend the money on doing another one? But That's since right. that was such a success, that just launched all the other Marvel movies. Yep. Yep. So it's kind of a ripple effect there. Totally. And I, and I think that's what makes the, that character so interesting is like we wanted we watched it just waiting for him to do the right thing, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like that's that, that's what kept your attention. The drama of it, like right. what's he going to do next? It's kind of like, gosh, he he has the capacity to do good. Will he will he make that because he wasn't righteous? And uh -huh. that's I think we all struggle with that same thing, you know, and um, that like what Paul writes in, in, in the Bible, you know. I, I want to do what, what I want to do, I don't do, and I do what I don't want to do. Yeah, you know? that's Romans 7. Yeah, he's struggling. Yeah. Struggling. Exactly. And, you, need, and you, need, you need to renew your mind, as Paul right. said. That's right. And uh, that's apparently what happens to Iron Man or Tony Stark. He renews his mind to the point and is counseled and loved by other uh, characters to get him to the point where he will become a hero. Yeah. It's sanctified, in other words. Yeah, exactly right. Sanctification mm -hmm. is a lifelong mm -hmm. process. That's right. And uh, yeah, that's it's, it comes down to the company we keep. So find good company because mm -hmm. <laughs> they that's will right. sharp, iron sharpens iron, as they say. As that's well. one of the little subtitles in the Iron Man chapter. Iron that's sharpens it. iron. That's right. Whereas Captain America and Iron Man sharpen one another. That's right. So let's, uh, let's touch on uh, who you already mentioned, which a lot of people... You know, oftentimes Christians are, are wary of engaging in popular culture, especially yep. movies like Harry Potter series. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about Harry Potter. How do you address this in the book? Because most people yeah. who have seen Harry Potter or think of Harry Potter, the last thing they're thinking of is Jesus. Yeah, I know. And what we say in the very first line of that chapter is arguably Harry Potter is the character in modern fiction that most 
resembles Jesus. And people go, what? Are you kidding me? This is the, this is the movie series that a lot of Christians boycotted. Now, let me just say off the top, whatever parents decide is appropriate for their kids in this regard, I side with them. They know their kid better than I do, right? But I think a lot of parents had a knee-jerk reaction against the Harry Potter series because of the magic in it, whereas they didn't have that same knee-jerk response against, say, Lord of the Rings or Chronicles of Narnia, which both have magic in it. In fact, Gandalf in Lord of the Rings is a wizard, right? Just like Harry Potter. So why is Gandalf okay, but Harry Potter not, according to Christians, right? I think, we, I, I think we had kind of a bit of a double standard. And if you do look at the Harry Potter series, first of all, the magic in the Harry Potter series is not the kind of magic generally that the Bible is talking about. It's not talking about um, the, the uh, contacting the dead and all this stuff in the Old Testament, although there is one incident in one of the Harry Potter stories where they do try and contact the dead, but nothing happens, okay? Most of the magic in the Harry Potter series is just made up stuff out of J.K. Rowling's head. Like, what, no, nobody thinks that you can get on a broomstick and fly around and play a modified game of soccer in the air, right? I mean, this is just made up fantasy stuff. Uh, and uh, she even says, magic's not the center of the story. What's the center of the story is, can Harry live a moral life to save his universe? It's really a... It's really a morality play is what's going on. And in fact, Harry Potter has parallels Jesus in four specific ways, maybe more, but these are the four we look at. Number one, Harry Potter is prophesied to be the savior of his world before he's born, and an evil force tries to murder him as an infant to prevent that. Does that sound familiar? Okay. Secondly, Harry Potter must live a moral life in order to be the savior of his world, Thirdly, he sacrifices himself in order to defeat the Satan figure Voldemort. And then fourthly, he rises from the dead, and then his followers have to put their faith in him in order to ultimately defeat the Satan figure Voldemort. Now, those four things are exactly the story of Jesus, if you think about it. And J.K. Rowling said that the entire series can be epitomized by two Bible verses, which are found in the books and the movies. The two Bible verses are, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, from the Sermon on the Mount. And the other is, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And that, of course, is from 1 Corinthians 15. And she says, look, uh, Rowling says, these are very British books. You're going to expect to find Bible verses in them. And she said, I never wanted to talk about this much, the parallels to the Bible, because she didn't want her readers to be tipped off as to where the story was going. She's basically taking the storyline of the Bible and adding some other elements and characters to it, and that's the, that's the whole Harry Potter story. And, uh, and Christians have, have just dismissed it out of hand. Now, maybe why they didn't dismiss Lord of the Rings and Chronicles of Narnia out of hand was because they knew they were both written by Christians. For example... Uh, of course, Tolkien was a devout Catholic, and, Tol and of course, C.S. Lewis, we all know he, he was a, probably the greatest apologist of the 20th century. What they don't realize is when, when Harry Potter was released, nobody knew who J.K. Rowling was. In fact, they didn't even want people to know whether she was a man or a woman. That's why they put J.K. Rowling on there. And so it didn't come out of a Christian publishing house, so a lot of Christians are going, well, what is this thing? Is this good or bad, Right. But she's an Anglican Christian. Whether she's born again or not, I don't know, but she claims to be part of the Church of England. And she's just borrowing the Bible story uh, in order to create this Harry Potter series. So it's time we take another look at that series. And here's a series, by the way, which has virtually no sex. There are no curse words in it. It's, it's a wholesome morality play. And a lot of Christians just have, a, have completely dismissed it without taking a closer look. Whereas yeah. Chronicles of Narnia... And Lord of the Rings are just fine. Yep, agreed. And I, and I like all those movies very much. Uh, uh -huh. But w once you highlighted and, and talked about that in your book, it really, it just pushed me over the edge of like, I, I'm excited my son is, is in his first Harry Potter book in the series. Oh, yeah? He's at, 10 years old, you say? He's 10. Right. So, I mean, I, I love it because he's going to, he's going to get all of this great storytelling that uh, parallels and, and, and is in alignment with the greatest story. 
and mm-hmm. uh, and the greatest hero, which is so great. So I'm 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 excited about that, and everyone should go back now and watch those movies from start to finish, which mm-hmm. are so good. And with with this newfound knowledge in mind, I think it. Well, that's what we recommend, especially for parents. If, if your kids love these kind of movies, why don't you do movie night every now and then? Yeah. Read the chapter first, then watch the movies, because after you read the chapter, you're going to be alert for certain things that you probably wouldn't be alert uh, about before. Yeah. And then you can see these biblical life lessons. You can see the parallels to Jesus. You can see uh, the, 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 the moral lessons that you get from watching some of these movies. So that's what we do. Get the book Hollywood Heroes, How Your Favorite Movies Reveal God, and then do movie nights. You can do a movie night a week for, for probably, probably half the year. Yeah. using this book you know oh without question yeah, yeah. without question because there's mm-hmm. so many movies in these se- in some of these series unbelievable now, not every movie is going to be appropriate for small children right but you know you get into the preteen or the teen years yep. and just about any of these movies you can see yeah no doubt um now I, we have I, a list in the front of the book by the way yes no you do i yeah. i do highly urge everyone the book i mean this just went out uh came out in may and mm-hmm. uh you know, so go on. You can find it anywhere. It's on Amazon. You can. I I download books that I like. I download it on Audible, so I can immediately have both versions of it. And um, it, it's you know, don't hesitate. Go out and do it. You'll you'll appreciate it. Trust me. Um, let's go. Let's move on to a, a movie series, which for me was probably my my most favorite as a, a, a young person. I was born in the '70s. I grew up with Star Wars. The original episode four, five, and six were my you know, Luke Skywalker and the whole mm-hmm. Darth Vader thing. Mm-hmm. I was a huge fan of that. Obviously, you talk a lot about Darth Vader. Um, a little, Obviously, Luke Skywalker you, you bring up as well. But Darth Vader is really kind of the, the focus in the book. And his name, obviously, is Anakin Skywalker, Luke Skywalker's father. And he... Oh, you just blew it, man. Oh, sorry about that. No spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. But his fault. The movie, in the, what does the movie's been out for forty five years. If you need a spoiler alert, where have you I, been? Okay. I know, I know, right? Like, yeah. If 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 I just ruined your day, then uh, yeah. you know, I apologize. Wait, Darth Vader's Luke's father? What? Oh, no, oh, no. That's so, scary, man. What? What does this? <laughs> oh, those, that? those are crickets. Wait, I got to give you the scary. Here's the scary one. There's the scary. All right, all right I love right. it. <laughs> So what does the, the, this nature, this dark side of Anakin Skywalker, what does that teach us about the nature of sin and bad people like Darth Vader going to heaven? Like what, what, what are we to get from somebody that's so, you know, on screen, so evil, so bad, mm-hmm. you know, and, and like what, what can we really, what's the big takeaway with somebody like that character? Well, there's a couple of things. First is, is that sin, according to James, the half-brother of Jesus, who wrote that little book in the New Testament called? James. Very good. You're sharp. You're very sharp today there, Chris. <laughs> um, he says that um, the reason we sin is because we're enticed and dragged away. Almost sounds like being caught in a trap, right? We, 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 we chase down our desires, whether it's sex, money, or power, and we're enticed and dragged away. Well, that's exactly what happens to Anakin. He's enticed by certain things he wants. He wants power. He wants his family protected. He's motivated a lot by fear. And he ultimately turns to the dark side. And he winds up doing a lot of evil, even evil murdering innocent women and children uh, with, without any regret, without any remorse. And so what we do is we, we, we track how he falls. In fact, at one point, George Lucas, of course, the producer of these movies, said when Anakin gave in to the Sith Emperor, the guy wasn't the Emperor yet, but he said, I'm a Sith, and that's the guy that Anakin's supposed to be fighting. But the, the Sith said, I can get you what you want. Anakin said, okay, I'm on your side now, right? And Lucas said, that it's, it's at that point that that Anakin succumbed to temptation by the devil, <laughs> right? And uh, so then, as you know, he slides into, uh, well, he slides into a volcano almost, actually. That's why he's all burnt up. And, and uh, in, in Lucas's movies, people who have physical deformities, they have physical deformities because they've sided with the dark side. 
Whereas if you notice the people on the light side don't have any physical deformities, Luke and, and uh, Leia, they're all, you know, pretty people. Whereas Darth Vader is half man, half machine. I, I can't remember who says it in the movie, but they say something like, he's more machine than man. Right. You know, right. he's got on a breathing machine and all this. So his deformities reveal his moral behavior or immoral behavior. And we have a section in the in the chapter in Hollywood Heroes on on in the Star Wars chapter. And the title of it is something like, can bad people go to heaven? Like, can Darth Vader go to heaven? I mean, he's done so much evil, even though at the end, OK, yeah, he he basically says, Luke, you're right. You know, and he's saved by Luke and all this. Can he go to heaven? Well, our answer is, is that only bad people go to heaven. There are no good people because we're all fallen. Oh, yeah, maybe we're better than our, our, our neighbors or we're better than an axe murderer, but we're still evil. We're comparing ourselves to one another rather than comparing us to the ultimate standard of good, God's nature, as expressed through Jesus. And so if God is just, and he is, and he's infinitely just, he has to punish sin, and we're all sinners. Yeah. And the only way we're going to get to heaven is by trusting in what he's done, because we're going to be forgiven and then given his righteousness. So... Anybody can go to heaven if they have Christ as their substitute. And so we point that out, of course, in the chapter on Star Wars and in other chapters as well. Yeah. No, you do a great job of talking about that in the book because we all kind of put ourselves, we separate ourselves, right, from the bad and the evil people mm -hmm. of the world. We like to think mm -hmm. of ourselves as good, as good people. Yeah. But yeah. every day I do something that, I'm, that I regret that could be classified as a, an evil act. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or thoughts, right. or you know, uh, we're we're all evil. We're all bent toward evil. And I, I, in fact, I was just preaching this week at a church out in California, and I said, "Do you realize that you can get to heaven by being good?" And they were all stunned. What do you mean? And I said, "You just got to be perfect." Too late for me, right? How about you? <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. If I if I've been perfect to this point and I continue to be perfect, I don't need a savior. But too late for me. I haven't been perfect, and neither of you. So we all need a savior. No doubt about that. Love it. Okay, so uh, we've we've tackled some good ones. You you mentioned J.R.R. Tolkien uh, mm -hmm. a little bit earlier with Lord of the Rings, which is if you have not watched the Lord of the Rings movies or the Hobbit movies, where have you highly, been? Highly, or where have you been? It's one of the best movie sagas I've ever seen in my life, and the character development and stuff is so great. Um, one of the greatest books and and and, and movie series ever. There's so many great heroes with the character traits of Jesus. And Tolkien convinced the legendary British writer C.S. Lewis that Christianity was the true myth, as you mentioned at mm -hmm. the beginning of the show. What does that mean, the true myth? Well, before Lewis was a Christian, he was an atheist, and then he was kind of moving a little bit toward theism. And he always loved uh, stories of dying and rising gods. Most of these came after Christianity. And at one point, Tolkien, who was in a, a group called the Inklings with, with Lewis, where these, these writers would get together, these British writers would get together, I guess, once a week and just, you know, talk and fellowship. At one point, Tolkien, who wrote Lord of the Rings, said to Lewis, Jack, that was what they called him, Jack. Jack, why are you so enthralled with all these dying and rising god myths except when you read about something like this in the New Testament. You're not enthralled with it then. And it got Lewis thinking, and Tolkien said to him, you know, you're enthralled with these myths, but you're not enthralled with the true myth. This is the one that really happened, that Jesus really did die and rise from the dead. It's an historical fact you can check into. Mm. So you ought to believe in the true myth. All these other myths are just pointing to the true myth. And Lewis did check into it, as you know, and then he became probably the greatest apologist of the past hundred years. Wow. That's amazing. And you don't, you do mention it in there a little bit, obviously, because C.S. Lewis is hard not to mention. He comes up often on your podcast show. Um, a, a, a terrific philosopher, writer. Mm -hmm. uh, he, his quotes, people probably quote him without even realizing that it's him that they're quoting. I mean, mm -hmm. he's one of yeah. the greatest minds of the last couple hundred years. Um, he, it, it, it kind of, in a lot of ways, right, because that's, 
ultimately what we're looking at. Look at Paul. Look at the, the writer of most of the, the books in the, in the New Testament. He was not a very good man earlier in his life, was he? Oh, he claimed, yeah, to be an insolent and arrogant man. Of course, he persecuted the church. He killed Christians, dragged them away at least. He was at the stoning of Stephen. Yeah, he wasn't a good man at all. And none of us are good men, ultimately. That's why, no. when, the, that's why when the rich young ruler called Jesus, oh, good teacher, Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's none good but God. Now, he's not denying his deity. He's asking this rich young ruler to, real, to try and realize what he just said. Yeah, I am good, which means I am God, because there are no men that really are good. Uh, there may be men that are less bad than other men, <laughs> but we're all bad. So that if someone says I'm a good person, you say you might ask them, does that mean you're God? Because there are no good people. <laughs> we're all fallen. I do good things, you could say, I guess. Yeah. But I'm, I, on occasion. I, yeah, on it would occasion. be like saying, you know, a, a glass of water with a big drop of arsenic in it is a good glass of water. No, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't drink it. Right? It could be 99% pure, but that 1% will kill you. Yep. And uh, actually, we're not, we're not anywhere near 99% pure. Yep. I think most of the time we're 99% impure. Yeah. I know it. Yeah, it's a reality check for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and for some people, it's really hard to hear. Oh, yeah, uh, but it's but, true. But you know what? It's, it's have, having those moments in your life where you really reflect on, on things are, are so important to get to know yourself uh, a little bit more and invest that time in, in yourself. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite all-time superhero is Batman, personally. Mm -hmm. I have a picture over here on my desk of me. Why do you like Batman, Chris? What's the deal with Batman? I love Batman because of what he stands for. I love Batman because he inspires justice. And when people do bad, they're, they, they, need, um, they need correction. And it, I think it's, the, it's one of those things where we all feel like in this world that we live in, when someone, when there's an injustice, we feel like someone needs to pay the price for that injustice. Mm -hmm. Look at mm -hmm. things that happen all the time, things that just recently happened in, with the school and the, these school shootings, yes. which are just Horrific. the most heartbreaking yeah. stories I've ever heard in my life with young mm -hmm. children. I couldn't imagine that. But if, if there was such a character as Batman, that's mm -hmm. who I would want you know, in the shadows and at, coming at, out at night to take care of these people that, that do evil acts mm -hmm. because I think justice has to be done. Um, I've loved him, like I said, since I was a little kid. I have pictures of me playing with Batman figures and dolls when I was a kid. I've just always inspired that. Um, dedicating his life to bringing the, the, the criminals of Gotham City to justice. But he's fighting a war that he'll never win. Seemingly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why is he losing? And, and what does this say about human nature? Yeah, I think Batman, the Batman series, as we point out in the chapter of Hollywood Heroes, depicts human nature most accurately, mm. uh, maybe more so than any other series, because notice that Batman never ultimately wins because there's always another bad guy the next night he has to lock up. He's never going to create utopia by just locking up bad guys because there's always another bad guy due to human nature that's going to take that bad guy's place. So it's he's fighting a losing war, but he fights it nonetheless. It's very similar to law enforcement, right? Law enforcement is never going to create utopia. What law enforcement is trying to do is prevent evil from taking over society. It's trying to limit evil. That's what Batman's trying to do. But they know they're never going to eradicate it completely due to human nature. Notice also Batman's always fighting in the dark. Very few scenes is he in the light. Yeah. Well, men love darkness rather than light. That's when they're going to do their evil. That's why Batman uses the darkness as cover, because he knows that's when they're conducting evil. That's where he needs to meet them. And he wants to use the element of concealment and surprise in order to take out the bad guys. But... It, it gets so bad that, as you notice, the character of Batman over the years has evolved oh, from you know, the, campy, the campy Adam West Batman series when we were kids, Biff, pow, boom, you know, to uh, the real dark kind of Batman we see today. 
and the darkness begins to, to affect him personally. You know, he had standards for a while, and then he started torturing his victims or his, his suspects, the criminals themselves, and, and so it was getting to him as well. And by the time you get to Batman and Superman, he's almost a nihilist. He's someone that doesn't even believe in any value, and then when they have that conflict with Superman, he ultimately snaps out of it and then helps Superman and Wonder Woman take out Doomsday. Which is a whole other story. Yeah, exactly. I I do love all the different reboots of Batman. I mean, I did Mm -hmm. grow up uh, watching the original, you know, uh, show with Burt Ward and Adam West. And I just, I thought that I loved it. I mean, Mm -hmm. that's all you have. I watched it all as a kid, too. I was was always amazed how Batman could take out a bulletproof shield from that little <laughs> vest, unfold it, and they'd all get behind it, and the criminals would never shoot, like, around the shield. They no. would just... <laughs> and then he had that big can of shark repellent. You remember that? He would just yeah, pull yeah. that out of his vest somehow. <laughs> yeah. It's great. It was like an aerosol can. Psst. Oh, shark went away. <laughs> One of my favorite scenes was, like, almost a go-to repetitive scene was when they were climbing up the side of a building. Oh, yeah. Doing the slow, the slow climb. Uh, with uh-huh. Robin b- behind them, you know, and they'd right. be having a conversation. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. just, it's I didn't even classic. know if that cape went down. Did it? It, <laughs> it might have yeah, a little bit, but yeah, I mean, it was the whole bit, thing was just the camera was just turned sideways turned, and they were just yeah. standing on the, on the ground doing it. Right, you know? right. It was just hilarious. But then, then they had the great reboot of the, you know, the late 80s and 90s with, you know, the Michael Keaton, the Val Kilmer, mm-hmm. the George Clooney edition. I watched mm-hmm. all of those, of course. It's starting to get a little darker. The Christian Bale series, my wife and I absolutely loved the most Mm -hmm. because we just thought he was a great pick. Yep. And and those are um, who 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 directed those? Were those Bay? Uh, Those were Nolan, Christopher Nolan. Christopher Nolan. That's who. Yeah. And those movies are great. Yeah. Uh, I thought that was great. But then in the latest installment, I was super impressed by it. Believe it or not, I'd heard from people how dark it was, and I'm like, geez, Mm -hmm. I mean, how much darker can they make it? But I thought they did a terrific job, um, and I, I just I saw the movie twice because I, I I liked it that much. That movie came out before we finished, or after I should say, we finished Hollywood Heroes, so it's not in the book. But I did notice there was a line at the end of the movie where he says something like, uh, "People want to know there's someone out there for them. They want to know there's hope." Yeah. Well, that's basically what Christianity is about. There is someone out there for you, and there is hope because it's hope that's already been accomplished. In the Bible, the word hope doesn't mean a wish or, gee, I, I just, I, I'm just anticipating this happening, and, and, and I want it to happen. I'm not sure if it will. That's not hope in the Bible. Hope in the Bible is it's certain. It's our hope. Jesus has risen from the dead, and he is coming back, and we can bank on that. And there's evidence for that. That's right. Yes, and if you want to hear the evidence, tune in to I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, which is a, a, a weekly radio show and podcast with Frank Turek, and uh, you won't... Uh, and there's some of the evidence so we, we, we... There's some of the evidence we put in this book, Chris. Um, yeah. You know, the, the book that goes through it in a systematic fashion is I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, but we folded in a lot of apologetics into the Hollywood Heroes book. You know, we've yeah. got arguments for God in there. We've got arguments for why, why should we believe the New Testament is telling us the truth when we get to the ultimate hero chapter, which is about Jesus at the end of the book. Yep. So we folded in a lot of arguments into this book. So when people read Hollywood Heroes, they're not just going to read about the movies, but they're also going to read about evidence for God. They're going to read about biblical life lessons that they can communicate to their kids or to themselves, actually. Mm. Um, And it's in the context of these movies, but it's a way to communicate it in a more fun and interesting way than just saying, here's why God exists. Here's the, you know, here's the evidence. Here's why the New Testament writers told the truth. You know, we're... We're folding it into the context of the movies. No, it, it's done very, very well. Yeah. Um, so one of the more unique superheroes ever is that of the ultimate woman, Wonder Woman. Yeah. And I've always been a big fan of her. I mean, I loved, was it um, Diane? Who's the original actress who played oh, Wonder Linda Woman? Carter was. Oh, Linda original. Carter. That's what I meant yeah, to say. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Diane. That's her her her, yeah. her name in uh, the movie. The character. Yeah, yeah, Wonder Woman yeah. is Diane. Um, what's the last name? Diana Prince. 
Diana yeah. Prince. Yeah. And I always loved that the one. I mean, they had great superhero shows back when we were, you know, when I was younger. They had the, obviously the Hulk show, which was really mm-hmm. good. And um, and so I was always a fan of of Wonder Woman, even as a you know as a boy. You know, you always like kind of the the guy, the masculine, mm-hmm. manly stuff. But I I always had a fascination with her as well. What is her most unique superpower, and how does that align with with Christianity? Why is she so yeah. significant and different from all the other superheroes? Well, the unique thing about Wonder Woman is her two biggest superpowers are love and truth. You go, what? Those are superpowers? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she carries carries the lasso of truth, right? And uh, love is also what she's trying to do. She's trying, in fact, in the in the second feature, major feature film for Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman 1984, she does not use brute power to overpower the, the villain, who happens to be a guy by the name of Max Lord. It's a long story. I don't have time to get into it. I don't want to spoil your, your, your movie experience anyway, right. except to say at the end, she actually convinces him to repent of what he's doing and points out to the fact you haven't loved your son enough and you need to get back to loving your son. And it turns out he does repent, and that causes a chain reaction that actually saves the world. So she convinces him to repent. She doesn't even use brute force. She lassos him with truth, and she asks him to get back to loving her, his, his son, and that's what saves the world. Yeah. So that's the unique thing about Wonder Woman. And by the way, she's not going to follow her heart either. She's going to follow the truth. That's right. In the first movie, which is called Wonder Woman, um, she actually, uh, well, actually, no, this, this came up in the second movie, too. In the second movie, she could keep her love interest, who is uh, Steve, what's Steve's name? Steve Trevor, I think is his name yeah, is in the correct. movie. He's played by Chris Pine. Yeah. And, uh, but if she does keep her love in, interest, if she does follow her heart, she's not going to be able to save the world. So she basically says, I got to follow the truth, and she has to let her love interest go in order to save the world. Now that's that's a counter cultural lesson there. The culture says follow your heart. Wonder Woman says nope, can't do that. Got to follow the truth. Yep. Same thing is true in Iron Man. Nope, can't follow your heart. Got to follow the truth. Uh, so, and the movie makers, whether they knew this or not, are putting a biblical lesson in there because they know that's that's truth. That's what resonates. If people just continue to follow their heart, that's not inspiring at all. That's that's selfish. We got we don't want to see that. Yep. And yet, on one hand, the culture's saying do that. On the other hand, when culture puts it in entertainment, they give you the opposite message. Yeah. Don't follow do, your heart. Follow what do we do truth. when we're parenting our kids? Do we let them just have everything and get away with everything and be selfish, yeah. little, rude, little people? Yeah. Or do we correct them and love them towards goodness and exactly doing right and sharing with others and being kind to others and and saying and doing the right things and treating people with, with love and respect and that goes well, against a lot of their natural uh, inclination, doesn't it? Yeah, all the, it goes against their hearts. Although uh, a lot of, uh, of kid movies put forth this follow your heart motif, many of the Disney movies do. Uh, when it comes to the most successful movies, and particularly those in the superhero and fantasy genre, follow your heart doesn't resonate. That's right. What resonates is sacrifice. Yeah. Don't follow your heart. Sacrifice yourself to save others. And that's the Christian story. Yep. Without question. Well, I, mm-hmm. that's a whole s- another conversation, but I, mm-hmm. I feel like at some point Disney's going to have a major correction in uh, I hope so. how they're going about things because th- yeah. they're making some bad moves here in recent right. times. But uh, yeah, that's it. Maybe that'll be another podcast that we can get in and dive into <laughs> some things mm-hmm. down the line. But mm-hmm. uh, so. You finish the book and wrap it up. How's this? How's this book come to a conclusion? Well, it has to conclude with the ultimate hero. Of Jesus, it does. Of in fact, if you don't mind, let me just just read the opening couple paragraphs from the uh, the ultimate hero chapter. Here it is. If you were making up your own superhero, what kind of qualities would your hero have? Imagine you could create someone who had Captain America's righteous idealism, Iron Man's genius, Harry Potter's willingness to sacrifice, Skywalker, uh, Luke Skywalker's discipline, Sam's loyalty, Frodo's humility, Aragorn's courage, Gandalf's wisdom, Batman's focus, Superman's power, Wonder Woman's love. You would have Jesus, right? Actually, you would have someone closer to Jesus than any of these heroes individually. 
but you would still be a long way from the real Jesus. And we go on to say the person of Jesus is unique in all of history and literature. No one rivals him. There are commonalities, as we have seen here in the book Hollywood Heroes, but there is no perfect match because there is no one with the perfect credentials of Jesus. And then we go through and we point out how Jesus is the perfect and ultimate hero, even though these other heroes have some elements that are similar to Jesus or characteristics similar to Jesus, they don't have them in the perfect and full way Jesus has. And so we point that out in the last chapter, the ultimate hero. That's where all this is pointing to. So if you love any of these superheroes or like any of these superheroes, you're going to love Jesus. It's, it's terrific. It's, it's a, it's, it, it's, it really does a fine job of, of bringing all of this to a, a choice and, and something for people to ponder is why do we need a savior? Mm. Can't, can't we just be good and, and go to heaven? Mm. But ultimately, our life is, has to be about something. Um, you know, the, the, the biggest question I think most people have is, why are we here? Why mm-hmm. am I here? What, what, what is this human experience all about? Are we just, like you call, call it moist robots, right? Are we just, are we just here by random chance and just you know, from, from a big explosion billions of, of, of years ago, we, we just exist because we exist? For no good reason. <laughs> I, don't, I yeah, can't many of us, Many of us, although, you know, we, we live in the most comfortable time in human history, but we have no purpose. We have no meaning. We have everything to live with and nothing to live for. And what Christianity comes along and says is, no, you're here for a reason. You're here to know God and to make him known. And I'm giving you the privilege of building the eternal kingdom with me. You can be part of it and you can help build it. That's why we're here. So... Uh, the movies are just ways of saying the same thing <laughs> that people want to be, they want to build a kingdom. They want to build something beyond them. They want to be taken from this world of pain and suffering and they need someone to sacrifice for them to do it. And that's what Christianity does. That's what Jesus does. Yeah. So without any purpose, we're, we, we wind up in despair. Look, you can either have hope or you can have despair. Those are the two things you can have in life. And Christianity gives you hope. Hope for eternity, hope for the future, despair, atheism, nihilism, materialism doesn't. No, it absolutely doesn't. And that's what's, I guess that's what's so frustrating, right? For somebody that is a a believer and somebody that is aware of all their faults and aware how much we need a savior, how much we need more Jesus in our lives and to Mm -hmm. try and be more Christ-like. And as I've gotten Mm -hmm. older and hopefully a little bit wiser, uh, the awareness has grown stronger. Uh, I, I can't say that I'm a, a better person than I was, but I'm more aware of all of my flaws and shortcomings and how much more I need Jesus in my life mm-hmm. and to try mm-hmm. and follow in his footsteps as best mm-hmm. I can. Absolutely. Um, yep. and, and, I, and I think that's really where ultimately what you want people to do is search, search themselves like, you know, why <laughs> to ask yourself some of these questions. Cause so many people just bounce around like a, a ball on a pinball machine going through life, going through the motions of life and not really considering what this is all about. Yeah, they don't have purpose, and uh, they, they, they want to anesthetize themselves quite often from why are we even here. Let me just, let me not even think about that. Let me just watch another Netflix series. I don't, I don't want to think about what life's all about. But yeah. if life is all about knowing God and making him known, then everything we do can take us either closer to that or further away from that. Yeah. But when we know that is the purpose, then we can endure things that are difficult because they do help us make no. They help us know God better, as uh, Second Corinthians four says. So, uh, the superhero movies are just ways that people who are Christians or non Christians express themselves to say, "I wish it was like this way. I wish there was someone that could come save us." Well, there's someone who, who has, and he's going to come back as well. So that's really what we're hoping the value of Hollywood heroes will be, is that people 
uh, will take this if they like movies and see what goes on in these movies and realize this is what Christianity is all about. And uh, kids who love, love these movies can get more interested in the truth of Christianity if you point out these parallels. And even if the kids don't watch the movies, you don't want them watching the movies, they should probably know the plots because they might have friends that do love the movies and watch them. And if you can point out the connections between the movies and the truth, movies and Jesus, you might get your, you might, your, your kid might be an evangelist for Jesus through the movies, you know, with his, with his, with his, his or her friends. So that's what we're hoping Hollywood heroes will do. Well, thank you so much for, for doing this. Uh, and thank you to your son as well. Uh, it, it's, it's just a wonderful book. And I encourage anyone. Where, where are some places, uh, Frank, that, that our listeners can go right now to, to A, get the book, but uh, also follow you? Well, uh, our website's crossexamined.org. It's crossexamined with a D on the end of it.org. We have an app. We have a YouTube channel, thousands of videos on the YouTube channel, crossexamined, two words. Uh, we also have a, a podcast, as you mentioned, called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. Wherever you get podcasts, you can find that. And there is even a little uh, website for the book, hollywoodheroesbook.com, hollywoodheroesbook.com. And there's a little 30-second trailer in there as well. So they can see the book there. They can also see where they can buy the book, you know, Amazon, our website, wherever you want to go to get the book is fine. Yeah. Just leave a nice positive review up there. If you didn't like the book, then you never heard me say anything. Just leave it alone. <laughs> I gotta go out. do. I gotta go do a review for you. Do a review. Um, put it up for, there for the book. Put it up yeah, at I Amazon gotta... and Impact. We're at our Impact is our other website. But just go to crossexamine.org, click on store. You'll see it there. Love it. Well, thank you for your time today. It's been just so much fun for me. Uh, so helpful and enlightening. And I hope our listeners got a lot out of it and uh, run right out and grab their copy of Hollywood Heroes. Thank you, listeners, for supporting us on the Strong by Design podcast, what we do here. Uh, we release an episode every single week. We're uh, not stopping any day soon. In fact, we're ramping up and getting better and better as we go. This year has been an incredible year of growth for the show, and we're reaching more people than ever, heard in over 80 countries around the world. So thank you for being part of it. And uh, we'll be back next week, as always, on Wednesday when the new episode drops. Coach Chris here. Thank you so much and God bless you.